tie must have a stop, like Aldous Huxley. You know, when I was in, you know, 12 and middle school, anyway, we had Brave New World, and so it was very good, obviously. And then it was like, well, let's just see, like, what else the author wrote. So I read a whole lot of books by Aldous Huxley. You know, of variable quality, one of which is Time Must Have a Stop, which is perhaps not a book for which Aldous Huxley is remembered. Except by me. So I was, uh, oh dear, the bag says that the novel, this is the novel that Aldous Huxley himself thought was his most successful and fusing idea with story. And, well, Aldous Huxley, you were mistaken about your own work, I'm afraid. Or I missed it. It's very bizarre, like, you, this character Eustace dies, and then he's, like, stuck in some kind of, like, in-between agnostic afterlife world. It's, you know, as I recall. And then there's a lot about, like, the boy, Sebastian Barnack, like, losing his innocence, which is sort of, was just not interesting to me. <laughs> I was more into Uncle Eustace. <laughs> when he died, it was, like, all over for me in this book, I'm afraid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uncle Eustace. Because, you know, he had money. He didn't take shit too seriously. He had art, and he was rich. I already said he had money. Uh, you know, he's kind. Could do a lot worse than Eustace Barnack. I don't, I don't know. It's Sebastian Barnack, I don't know if he's paternal or maternal. I think it's a paternal uncle. I think it is Eustace Barnack. Someone that one feels like, you know, now could sleep with him and not only would he be sexually experienced but he would be appreciative sufficiently appreciative good old uncle used to and Pierre finishes his promenade I think I'll see what I can find of uncle used to Hey, kiddo. Settle thyself. Settle thyself. Thank you. Eustace laughed with unaffected good humor. Twenty-three years before, he had given up what everybody said was a most promising career in radical politics to marry a rich widow with a weak heart, and retire to Florence. It was an act which neither his sister nor his brother, though for different reasons, had ever forgiven. Etc., etc. With the exception of unmentionable great-uncle Luke, Eustace was the first who had ever gone over to the hostile camp of luxury and leisure. Very pretty, he said to her, in the phrase and tone of one who applauds a particularly well-directed stroke at billiards. With an income of 6000 a year, he could afford to be magnanimous. Besides, his conscience had never troubled him for what he had done. For the five years of their brief married life, he had been as good a husband as poor dear Amy could expect. And why any quick-witted and sensitive person should feel ashamed of having said goodbye to politics, he couldn't imagine. Whereas I'm disgustingly self-indulgent, he said. And if I happen to be fat, it's entirely my own vicious fault. Has it ever struck you, my dear, that if Mother had lived, she'd probably have grown to be as big as Uncle Charles. 
How can you say such things? cried Mrs. Polshot indignantly. Uncle Charles had been a monster. It was in the family, he answered, and patting his belly complacently. It still is, he added. The sound of a door being opened made him turn his head. Well, Sebastian, I hope you're prepared for a pretty strenuous holiday. Once again, Eustace patted his stomach. You see before you the world's champion sightseer, author of Canters Through Florence, The Vatican on Roller Skates, Round the Louvre in 80 Minutes, and my speed record for the English cathedrals has never even been challenged. That is kind of funny. You see, you know, you'd have a good time with Eustace.